Good morning. Uh, excited to be here. And it is Bluebird time, I guess, for the next 15 minutes at least. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about as a company and um, really focused on throughout the history of the company is this concept of, of recoding. Um, and this is the case for, for all of us in this field. We really have to change systems. Uh, we have to change the way we're developing these therapies, the way that we're delivering these therapies. And that's really uh, where we are as a company right now, not only uh, on the research side, development side, but now um, having to recode on the commercial side. So it's a, it's a really exciting time uh, for us, for sure. Uh, I will be making forward-looking statements as well, so please refer to the SEC filings for more information on that in terms of the risks of the company. When we talk about recoding for, for life as conveyed on this, this slide, it's the middle um, part of this slide that, that really is the anchor for, for Bluebird, always has been and will continue to be, and this is the concept of it truly being, being uh, personal for us. Yes, we're applying kind of some of these radical care concepts um, to the field, and many others are as well, uh, and we're all in our own way pioneers with, with a purpose. But I'm gonna share one story about a sickle cell patient, uh, actually not a patient, an advocate that I met a number of years ago that really resonated with me um, in terms of the, the plight of, of the patients uh, that we desperately seek to serve. I was um, at a conference that was a sickle cell uh, affiliated conference and um, made a company presentation and a woman came up to me after the presentation and grabbed a hold of my wrist in a very aggressive way. Um, almost to the point that I was starting to lose feeling in my hand. And she progressively over the next five minutes told me a story of a, a woman um, that came from, uh, I think it was the Caribbean, uh, who had sickle cell disease. And uh, how she'd come here and unfortunately started to, her sickness started to get worse. She described the pain medications that this woman is on chronically. And it was um, devastating to me to hear all of the manifestations of the disease just in the last month that she described to me, the number of pain medication she was on chronically to um, fight off the pain that she has chronically, and the tears, most importantly, the tears in this advocate's eyes. Uh, it was stunning to me, and the entire time I'm losing feeling in my, in my hand. And it wasn't until she said to me, please help me stop her pain, please, and she just reiterated that, please help me stop her pain, you're gonna help her stop the pain, aren't you, aren't you? And it wasn't until I said, yes, we'll, we'll help stop the pain that she finally <laughs> relented on my hand and I got the feeling back in it. But the reason I tell this story is because it really does anchor us every day in what we, what we have to do um, for sickle cell patients and for some of the other patients that, that, we, uh, that we're trying to treat here. Um, and I'll talk about man many of those here in this presentation. So beginning of this year, we set out a pretty bold vision for the, for the company. We're fortunate to have four programs that are uh, clinical stage programs, one of which has recently received approval um, in Europe. But you can see them here targeting thalassemia, TDT, um, uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, which is a very rare disease of, of the brain, sickle cell, as I referenced, and then our program in collaboration with, uh, with cell gene targeting multiple myeloma, that's a CAR-T program. Um, the intent is, the hope is, the belief is that we will have four products commercialized or nearly commercialized by 2022. That's a pretty bold statement for a still relatively small company to have the first four products that we endeavored to develop to be uh, potentially commercial products. And you can imagine underpinning that is a very, very deep uh, development team and research team um, that is also bringing next generation products forward as represented by the bottom part of this slide. The most important part of this slide, though, refers to that, the pain that I was talking to you about, and that's the impact on patients. That is the anchor, um, I think, for, for all of us. As I reference, it is a bit of an unprecedented, we believe, opportunity in front of us to have an impact on a broad set of patients across the globe. And you can see the progression, or the potential progression, I should say, of our programs um, throughout the next uh, three or four years with the expectation that the research and development engine underneath that will continue to fuel a pipeline for the long term. CLD is, is um, 
the disease that uh, really anchored Bluebird uh, back in 2000 and 10, 2011. It was the reason for the original investment in, in Bluebird. And it's a devastating disease. You can see here, very rare, um, but a lethal disease for young boys that develop symptoms at an early age. And the data that we have reported to date has been quite compelling. You can see it here, 15 out of 17 reaching the primary endpoint after 24 months. So we're very hopeful that this will be a commercial product um, in the not too distant future. And up here, you can see some of the scans from some of the boys, which I don't have time, obviously, to go into. Um, but this is a phase three program, um, and you saw the dates on the prior slide in terms of when we anticipate filing. The hope is that we can halt the progression of this disease in, in many boys that uh, ultimately become symptomatic. This is Larice. We, we, we know Larice and her experiences, and you can see them here, quite devastating for severe thalassemia patients. I'm not going to go through it, but you can read it for yourself. It's a potentially fatal disease if not um, treated with uh, transfusions. And despite the advances, these patients ultimately still die early because of iron overload over time because of the disease and some of the uh, transfusions that they're getting to keep them alive. <clears throat> this is the basis upon which we submitted um, for approval in Europe, product known now as, as Integlo. Uh, it's kind of fun to be able to talk about a branded product uh, really for the first time uh, this year. Pretty exciting for us. And the data support, um, hopefully, the impact on patients across Europe where it's more prevalent than in the United States. What I really want to talk about beyond the data and the impact on patients is the work that we have been doing now for a year, year and a half to get ready for a commercial launch in Europe, which is a bit unorthodox that you're going to Europe first versus the U.S., but it was afforded uh, to us by, by virtue of a regulatory pathway, an aggressive regulatory pathway, and we were a pilot program uh, in that pathway. But you can see all the components that we've had to work on to get an autologous cell therapy, gene therapy in this case, ready for commercialization across um, the enrollment, which is fairly standard, but then the collection of the cells, the processing of the cells, uh, ultimately leading to the transplantation of those cells back into the patient after they're gene modified, um, and all that, that is associated with this. There's a phrase that the process is the product, uh, the patient is the process, and the process is the patient in autologous cell therapy. And this is what you're dealing with when you have uh, that type of, of a, a therapy and the complications associated with it. We're well along our way of getting uh, qualified treatment centers up and running, which is a monumental task. I went through early this morning on our panel exactly the components of trying to get ready to, to treat that first patient. And we do have a centralized manufacturing facility for that drug product, uh, the gene modification of the cells in Munich, Germany. But a, a large swath of the company is now focused on this in, in Europe and getting ready for not just the first patient, but subsequent patients after that. We have announced, as you may know, a fairly uh, unique and novel way of pricing this, this product. It's a five-year um, program where the price is distributed over five years with the second four years being at risk. So we're willing to go at risk based on outcomes of, of that patient. Um, so it's an exciting time to be engaging the community in Europe, in particular in the U.S. now as well, but in Europe in an earnest way. And I can tell you that the excitement around this is the fact that um, of the four countries where we are engaged now, there is universal interest in, in, in having a discussion about this and a universal interest in trying to figure out a way to make these long-term value-based payments work. And it just makes sense, especially for therapies um, like this. To that, uh, more to come on that as we progress, in particular in Germany first and then subsequent markets. But um, so far, um, it's great to have the engagement from, from the payers, HTA bodies, et cetera. Sickle cell disease, uh, we all know it's a devastating disease. I described some of that in my opening remarks. The interesting statistic here, the mean age of death in the United States is 44 years. That is remarkable. That means it's an, a disease that, that needs more therapies. And there are some coming out. We believe we may have one that offers patients a, uh, a unique opportunity um, to have a transformative outcome. In this case, you're looking at the different components of hemoglobin, the red being that which comes from the gene therapy product, and you can see that we're generating approximately 50% of the hemoglobin from uh, a gene therapy product, which is non-sickling, and the belief is that that will lead to outcomes that are quite favorable for those patients, but obviously we have to continue to read the data out to prove that. Here are the trials ongoing 
um, to do uh, exactly that. We've expanded several of them to make sure that we have flexibility with the agency in terms of if the data were to turn out quite positive that we would be able to um, aggressively pursue a filing. But again, that's all data driven. Multiple myeloma is a program we have in collaboration with Celgene. This is the CAR-T program. We have um, our ongoing pivotal trial called Karma. And we have others as well planned or have started. You can see Karma 2, Karma 3, and Karma 4. Uh, these are trials that have started, and one of which is planned in earlier and earlier lines of therapy. That's been based on the data that we've seen to date in these re relapsed refractory patients in the Karma 1 trial, um, which have been uh, to date quite remarkable given that these patients uh, are refractory to almost everything that they've, they've faced. So um, stay tuned again on that in terms of more data coming out on, on that program, in particular, Karma. <clears throat> so those are a, a rapid look at the clinical programs and or the recently commercial program. But we do have a and have built a pretty robust research engine and set of tools and technologies over the last three, four years, some of which are internal, some of which are through collaborations with, we believe, some of the best of a breed of technologies out there. You can see some of them up here uh, on the screen. We believe that we can't do this alone. Um, so industrial partners are critical here. Selji and I just referenced, but we've got others on the research side and the pipeline side that are driving us toward uh, hopefully a deeper and deeper pipeline. And then academic collaborations are fundamental to all of us as we embark on trying to expand our ability to um, expose patients and get access to some of the expertise in some of these academic uh, institutions. So recoding, uh, we've found, is, is, uh, is hard. And on the research side of recoding, some of the experiences we've had are about this learning um, integration and iteration that one has to go through. So we've shown that with Zenteglo. We have a, basically a second generation product that ended up uh, being approved based on some manufacturing improvements we made throughout time. Um, we have effectively two products, uh, first generation and second generation in the clinic with regard to multiple myeloma. And we started the second generation before the first generation generated any clinical data. That's that constant iterative approach that one has to take um, to these type of therapies. And it relies on all of the tools, technologies, and experience base of not just us, but our partners to be able to do that. Um, this is the hope that we will have some of the um, best in breed coming forward in the, in the pipeline as well. <clears throat> Here is the pipeline that has emerged based on not only the clinical programs that um, you see on the SGD side and the oncology side, but also some of the emerging programs that we started to talk about this year for the first time at, uh, at Analyst Day um, when we disclosed not only the commercial side of the business and how we're building it, but also the research side of the business. And you can see it's not just in oncology, it also um, is on the SGD side and going after some of these other rare diseases, leveraging all of the experience that we've had uh, in those fields. And we're excited about um, disclosing some of those data as they progress into the, into the clinic. Lastly, here are some of the catalysts for, for the year, um, one of which has already been accomplished on the bottom, but we will be disclosing further data on Zinteglo, um, as you can see here on the sickle cell program starting the 210 trial by the end of the year, and then giving an update on the uh, um, Group C patients, which you saw the data from earlier in the presentation, uh, providing an update on, on karma by, by year end uh, at, a, at a place to be determined. That's ultimately really driven by cell gene, but, um, and then 21217 is that fast follower product that I mentioned in multiple myeloma to 2121, and we plan to give an update on that as well by year end. So with that, I'd um, like to thank you for attention and uh, appreciate uh, your attending arm. It's an exciting time to be here in the field. Thank you.